Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship today at St. Mark. Uh, Visitors, we're especially glad to have you here today. Um, The blue color heralds a new season of the church year, the Advent season, the beginning of a new church year. Uh, The blue for royalty, the presence and the coming of our King and Savior, our Lord Jesus, uh, both coming through his word to us, coming again in glory too. And we are called to be ready to meet him. Please stand. We begin this new church year in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God, our Father, asking him for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us. He has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. in his portions of Genesis chapter 6. At the beginning of this section, it talks about the sons of God and the daughters of men. Uh, The distinction is the sons of God, just like you and I are sons and daughters of God through faith, these are those who put their faith in the promise of a Savior given to Adam and Eve. The daughters of men refers to those uh, who are unbelievers, who just live for this life, don't put their trust in the Savior. When men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And this is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird and of every kind of animal and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. And Noah did everything just as God commanded him. This is the word of the Lord for our 
encouragement from the Old Testament. Today's sermon is based on these words. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. In the name of our coming Advent King, Jesus Christ, the Savior of all, brothers and sisters in him. <coughs> Dear, I just wanted to double check your schedule for tomorrow. You, you said you had a dentist appointment at 9.30. Okay. You remembered you're going to return the library books right after that. You said you're going to take them back. Okay. Uh, you're going to go out to eat with your parents for lunch. What, what's, oh, you're going to go over to the office after that. And, and at 327, the police are going to come and arrest you tomorrow. Okay? Got it. Sounds like a fun day. Is that how it works? The military, the police, SWAT teams, undercover agencies do not telegraph their actions for a purpose. They don't give away their plans and their timing to the enemy. They don't ruin years of undercover work trying to expose and get evidence on people all of a sudden just to say, hey, do you mind if we stop by tomorrow and bust in on your place and, and get a few of the bad guys? It doesn't work that way. And yet Jesus, in Mark chapter 13, telegraphs to the world his plans. He says exactly what is going to happen in the last days and on the last day of the world. He said just before our lesson, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. That's when the Son of Man will come. Not just in power and glory, but in great power and glory. His full majesty. That's exactly what is going to happen on the last day. But Jesus holds back something. He doesn't tell us when. He doesn't tell us when these events are going to occur. You can imagine the disciples, after they just hear about this, uh, saying, Jesus, that sounds pretty awesome. The, the sun is going to be darkened. The moon's not going to give its light. The stars are going to fall. When is this going to happen? And you know, sometimes in adult Bible study or Bible studies at, at campus, confirmation, there are questions that come and I have to say, that's a stumper. I, I don't know. Give me a week, I'll go back, I'll study up on it, and I'll hopefully come back next week with an answer for you. Can you imagine the disciples' astonishment as they're standing in front of Jesus, the Son of God, and they ask him, Jesus, when are these things going to happen? And he looks at them and basically says, guys, I, I don't know. Does that disturb your faith in him? That Jesus, being true God, doesn't know something. Isn't he supposed to be omniscient, all-knowing? Isn't he supposed to have this stuff down? I mean, maybe I can get away with that. I'm certainly not even close to God or our other pastors, but Jesus. In fact, this section right here in Mark, where it says, I don't know, that's one of the proof passages for other churches in, in the United States that 
try to show Jesus is not true God. Are they right? Uh uh. In fact, if they look a little closer, you'd see Jesus here is showing and telling the disciples exactly what is going to happen on those last days. The sun is going to be darkened. How can he know that stuff if he's not true God? How can Jesus say in the very verse right before our section, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away? It's as if he's really claiming to be the eternal Son of God who lasts and lasts forever. My words won't last. His will. If you look closely at this section, Jesus in no way is ever indicating he's not true God. He really is. But what he's showing to you and to me and to the world by these words is that he's really true man. It's that he's really thoroughly, completely one of us. He said right at the beginning, no one knows about that day or hour. And that includes himself. Sometimes it's hard for us to imagine that as Jesus lays aside the full use of his glory and power when he came to this world the first time, that that also means he set aside his all-knowing intelligence and he placed that and left that up in heaven. Can you imagine going to Jesus in the manger on day one of his life on earth and asking the inventor of the Hebrew language to say something in Hebrew and he would just look at you because he wouldn't know. It would be weird to go to him on, on the third year of his life on earth, his third birthday, and to say, Jesus, recite for me big sections of Moses. You should know this stuff. This is really your word. And he'd have to say, well, I know a couple of passages, but I don't know. Jesus, here's, here's what Joshua says. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. What verse is that? Oh, well, I could search for it and find it for you maybe, but... I don't know exactly where he says that. That's how completely Jesus became one of us. He had to learn in the exact way we learn. He sat down and he read this. He memorized this stuff. He recited it back to Mary and Joseph and the people at the synagogue when he went to Sabbath school. He had to learn just like us. And so as Jesus talks to us today, we have to keep in mind that even though the Father kept something from him, that doesn't diminish Jesus' trust, complete trust in God, nor should that diminish our complete trust in Christ as true God. What he says to us today, he says to us for our benefit and to take to heart. Why doesn't God tell us the time of his second coming? It's so that we don't forget who we are in our place in time and so that over time we don't neglect God's place in our hearts. Jesus says, It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. We really don't identify with, with the owner of the house here, and, and there's good reason. The owner of the house is extremely wealthy. You can imagine maybe he has a huge castle, maybe he has tons of possessions, tons of servants that keep this going on a day-to-day -day basis. You can imagine the kind of wealth it would take to just abandon that, leave it behind, and to go away on a, maybe a lifelong vacation. Maybe you're just going from spot to spot to spot, traveling and seeing the sights. And the owner never indicates when he's coming back. There's good reason we don't identify with the owner. It's because the owner here is God. And we are not him. But I think what happens over time when the owner leaves and day after day after day goes by, all of a sudden God's servants start to think maybe he's not going to come back. Maybe something happened to him. And you know what? It's a shame for this stuff to go to waste. This stuff really belongs to me. This is mine. When we're not the owner. 
don't you understand that nothing belongs to us? There's not one thing that's actually ours. The clothes that you wore today, as nice as they are, they don't belong to you. They're yours to use. The house that you're going to go back to and relax in, hopefully this afternoon, it's not yours. The car that you drove to get here doesn't belong to either. Even the kids that are in your possession or the grandkids that belong to you, they don't actually belong to you. Everything is God's. Have we forgotten our place and time? I think the hardest thing for Christians to remember is always that first commandment. You shall have no other gods. And that includes yourself. There's a reason why Jesus doesn't tell us the time. Yes, he doesn't know it realistically. He really doesn't know. But there's even more reason why God doesn't tell us the time. And that's because he doesn't want us to grow bigger than who we really are. We're not the owner. And it's godless for God's servants to forget to fear, love, and to trust in him above all things. And all of a sudden that starts to erode and we say, well, Jesus, it's, it's above most things or it's above a lot of things. It's above some things. I fear, love, and trust you above a few things. Okay, it's really nothing. Do we really expect that spiritual falling asleep and not taking sin seriously isn't going to come with consequences? For God's servants who forget who he is and make themselves bigger than who they really are and think of themselves as their own God and take their stuff as if it's all theirs, there's only one thing God is going to do when he comes back on this last day. And that's going to be to evict the godless. <clears throat> Timothy tells us, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out. We never did and we never will. We never brought anything into the world. We'll never take anything out. But there is one. There is one godly man who earned God's love who earned perfection with his life. And he wants to take us out of the world. There is one God-man who represents the, the full authority of God and who also represents us as being true man, just as he indicates here. And he takes our case before the Almighty God. There is only one go-between, the one who with his life on the cross took away the sin of the world and washed away all of our debts, all of our ungodliness, and who credits to our account his full godly life. Find your contentment in his forgiveness. His name is Jesus, the name that's above every name, the name of the Son of God who is going to come one day for his servants. Find your life in his. Because what he gives to us isn't to be owners, it's to be servants. The idea of a servant is very simple. A servant serves another. And in the context here, the servant is supposed to serve the owner. We have one person that we serve in life, and that's our Heavenly Father. Don't forget. Don't forget who you are. You don't serve a dictator. You don't serve a tyrant. You serve the loving King of Kings who died for you and forgives you. Don't forget who you are, His servant. And don't neglect His work. Jesus also said here, He leaves His house and puts His servants in charge, each with His assigned task and tells the one at the door to keep watch. God doesn't tell us about his return for a second reason. The first is so that we don't forget who we are. The second is that 
we don't procrastinate. If you really knew in 2010 Jesus was going to come back, well, then maybe we could slough off for a while. Maybe we'll start working and take this seriously in 2010. No, he wants us to take it seriously now. To get to work now. To work while it's day. That means students, God wants you to use your gifts and abilities to the best. And study. And not to put it off to the last minute and try and cram it down and then forget it the next day. You serve God as you serve your professor. Just as Jesus learned day by day and grew in wisdom, the same is for you. Learn a good work ethic. Kids, Jesus wants you simply to obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. That means when they tell you to make your bed, lovingly make your bed. When they tell you wash up, it's time for dinner, or knock it off, listen to them. Because they're God's servants placed over you who love you. Parents. God wants you to be parents. And that doesn't mean just to be home. That means to be the spiritual models of God's word in the house. How can you do that if you're not being fed yourself? How can you do that if you're not looking to the word and watching? You are God's watchman for the entire family. If you're not watching yourself, how can you watch for your kids and help them watch? Spouses, grow in faithfulness to one another by learning day by day Christ's perfect faithfulness to you. And when you fall short, look again at his forgiveness. Grandparents, elderly, be elders of the congregation. That means God wants you to use your wit and your wisdom and your practical experience of all of the years of your life that you've had and all of the times that you were tested in faith and you were forced to go back to the Word and to apply what God said and to hold to His promises. There are people struggling. When you see somebody who can use your help, go talk to them. Encourage them. Tell them God's promises have never failed. And model that humble Christian lifestyle by showing that even in old age, you never grow up from studying the word and learning even more. God wants his servants to work and to watch so that the whole flock here is ready for Jesus' second coming. In 2002, Sarah and I were vicars, or I was a vicar in Denver, uh, the northern, one of the northern suburbs. We lived in a modest place. It was an apartment called, uh, the congregation comically called it the Vicar Palace, but it certainly wasn't that. It was kind of a rough part of town. In fact, in the months before we got there, the former vicar told us that there were two apartments with meth labs that were busted, when we walked in a couple of times, every now, and then, every now and then we'd smell something sweet in the air and know somebody was doing something illegal. But it wasn't an uncommon practice for the police to be there at least once a week at one of the ten apartment buildings, complexes. Well, one night, Sarah and I had a little disagreement with our schedule and we were having a tough time making it work. And finally, after a half hour or hour, we figured out what we were going to do, and after that, Sarah decided to go run some errands and get some groceries or something like that. About five minutes after she left, there was a knock at the door, and I opened it up, and I see two stately police officers standing right in my door, and they had no sense of humor. And I said, hi, how are you? They said, fine. Is this apartment 102? I said, yeah. They said, sir, we had a call of a domestic disturbance here. Were you and your wife fighting? Uh, well, we had a disagreement about something, but no, I wouldn't call it a fight. Sir, where is your wife right now? Well, she just stepped out. She's going to be back in maybe a half hour, an hour. I could tell they did not believe me at all. Sir, do you mind if we look around for a little bit? Well, be my guest. Go ahead. So as they're walking around our small apartment, 
something just didn't seem right. So I said, do you have the right place? This is apartment 102, isn't it? I said, yeah, this is building six. Oh, we're looking for building two. And they quick scattled out the door and found the, found the right place. I shut the door and locked it and sat on the couch with a sigh of relief thinking, they weren't coming for me or for Sarah. There's a day coming when people will get no relief. Do you understand the Son of God is really coming? And for those people who slammed their door in his face, for those people who rejected his word, who wanted nothing to do with this, bigger than any SWAT team, better than any military, Jesus is going to kick those doors in and confront those people with who he really is. And though they give their excuses, but Jesus, rem remember, I, I knew who you were once upon a time. He'll say those three words and he'll add one more. I don't know you. And he'll take them off to eternal destruction. But for those of us who have kept watch, who've been waiting, looking for his arrival, focusing on the word, Jesus will say to us, well done, servant. Well done, servant. God doesn't tell us a time. God doesn't tell us when he's coming so that we don't forget who we are and so that we don't neglect his work over time. Keep focusing on the word. Keep watch. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God that surpasses our understanding, may it guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And in his name we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace.